Today we're going to wrap up the series called God's Favor. Of course, we've been referring to uh, the grace and faith relationship that you find within Scripture. Uh, so much, of, so much is said, and so much is talked about grace and faith, um, and. Uh, So much of it is understood outside of its original context. And so what I want to do is, as we wrap this series up, I want to do a quick review uh, and then get us all caught up to speed uh, to just kind of finalize what we have to say here. Again, there's so much that we could talk about. There's so much that needs to be unpacked, and this really is a first touch. And this is one of those things that I think that you have to do multiple flybys, if you will, uh, before it begins to uh, make more sense and clear. Uh, But it's also one of those things that... uh, Oftentimes, well, I think one of the best ways to do this is an information dump, and you just have to grasp what you can and then start putting the pieces together because there's so much, there's so many facets to this to understand this. The, the, the idea of grace and faith is used in Scripture. The terms grace and faith aren't particularly religious terms. They were terms that were used to describe a relationship that people entered into under the system that we today refer to as the patron system. The idea that if you wanted to do anything in life, it was more about who you knew, not about what you knew. And so you needed to know somebody. You needed to, know some, you needed to have connection somewhere in order to make it ahead in life, as it were, or in order to give yourself a step up, in order to accomplish anything outside of just barely surviving, taking care of your daily necessities. In fact, if you would go to the market each day to take care of those things that you needed for that day, the market was there as a result of patrons. That is, people who had access, had control to resources. They were wealthy people. They were powerful people. Uh, You needed to know them if you wanted to set up shop. You needed to know them if you wanted to make tents. You needed to know them if you wanted to be a seller of purple goods. You see these pictures throughout the New Testament. These people made the world tick, and you needed to know them. You had to have connections to them. You relied upon their generosity, see, because the things that they were willing to do for you were not based on anything that you had earned. You needed their generosity, but whenever they offered you the generosity, you in turn became their client. And in doing so, both of you agreed that you were entering into a bond, a relationship that would attach you at the hip, essentially. In other words, you were going to be there for one another. You were going to rely upon one another. There was something to be gained from this relationship as well. That's called the patron-client relationship, and it's within that that grace and faith function. Grace found its home within that. In the New Testament and in the New Testament times, this word grace was used to describe three different things. First, it was used to describe the generosity, that is the mindset of the one who had the resources, his desire, his or her desire to help you, that generosity. It had grace had to do with the actual gift itself. And grace also had to do with the recipient, that is the one who received it. Oftentimes when we talk about grace, we talk about the grace from the perspective of the recipient. Grace is so much more than just that. Grace had to do with the mindset of the giver, it had to do with the gift itself, and it has to do with the recipient, that is receiving it with gratitude, responding with grace. It was grace for grace. You were given a favor, you received it, you accepted it with gratitude, and you showed gratitude for the thing that was being given to you. And that gratitude was something that was lived out in this relationship that you entered into with this person. That relationship, that relationship was defined by, explained by the term faith. Faith. And remember, faith had to do with loyalty, had to do with trust, and had to do with dependability. In other words, you as the patron and you as the client. Oftentimes, patrons and clients, there was just this, this offsetting of social status. Typically, the patron would be of a higher social status, and you would be, well, inferior. And so, oftentimes, you, you need it. You needed the person who had access to these goods. You needed the person who had access to this power. You needed that person. You could not do this on your own. We have a tendency to think, I think, when you look at someone who has more power and wealth, as hoarding it, as it were, over those who had less. In the optimal, ideal relationship between patron and client, the patron responded to the client in the same way the client would respond to the patron. That is, through faithfulness. Both would have to trust one another. Both would have to depend upon one another. Both would have to be loyal to one another in order for this relationship to work. And remember, the Greeks referred to this as the dance of grace. We threw a picture up to this. Tons of artwork out there that depicts this relationship of this dance of grace. This thing where there's this interchange and exchange of favors and grace, of gratitude, of thankfulness, that is called a relationship. 
And in fact, sometimes when a patron would take on a client, that client, remember, would be one of equal social status. They just needed access to the goods that you had. They needed connections. Maybe you were the one who had the connections to the person who controlled the goods or the services. And when that happened, whenever you decided to enter into that relationship with someone of equal social status, you would not refer to them as a client, but you would refer to them as a friend. And that relationship you entered into would be a friendship. However, the friend had no quarrels about raising you up, honoring you, because of the generosity and the gratitude that you expressed that you gave to them. They understood their position, and they were more than willing, more than willing to, to stand there. There was nothing wrong with seeing oneself as being less than the other in that circumstance. Grace and faith, that's the context of the New Testament. That is the context through which Paul talks about grace and faith and relationship between those two. And as we've talked about in the last two, last two let messages, that is the picture that is presented to us of God, of Jesus, and then of our relationship with him, grace and faith. God is depicted as the chief patron, the chief benefactor. But while there are terms that relate God to what one would typically expect of a patron, the picture that is painted of God is one that far exceeds any expectations that anyone have, would have of a patron, of a benefactor. In fact, as the scriptures tells us, God is not just generous to those who will repay. He is generous to even his enemies, those who are hostile towards him. The picture is painted us of God offering favors to all. And the fact that he is faithful, he offers open access and assurance of ongoing favor. And we've unpacked this uh, two weeks ago. Last week, we referred to Jesus, and we, we looked at the picture that the, that the New Testament paints of Jesus and who he is and how Paul talks about Jesus in light of this patron system, helping people grab a hold of some concept, some idea for their understanding. But Jesus is depicted as a patron himself. But more importantly, I think oftentimes Jesus is depicted as the mediator. Remember this. Sometimes, sometimes what you needed the person you needed help from, you could not reach. You could not get to that person. You needed to know somebody. You needed to know somebody. And that person you needed to know was oftentimes what we refer to as a gatekeeper. In the New Testament, the term mediator was used. The term broker was oftentimes used to describe this person who stood between you and the person who had the ultimate control of these resources, of the service, of whatever it was that you were looking for. And the New Testament paints Jesus as the mediator. God as the chief benefactor or patron. Jesus as the mediator. But also the New Testament depicts Jesus as what? The gift itself. So Jesus is painted as a patron. More, more, more exactly, a mediator. And as the gift itself itself. Jesus embodied grace in this way. Those weren't just philosophical concepts. That was a reality and people could see that. It was a concrete way of understanding these concepts that Paul was marrying between grace and faith. And so Jesus is presented as his patron, as his mediator, as we talked about last week. But it wasn't just any patron, it was just mediator. He far exceeded any expectations because he gave up himself. In fact, there were times when patrons when patrons would literally stay devout to their calling as they were generous to others, even if it affected them, even if it harmed them, harmed their reputation, even if they went broke, if it, if they, if it put them in, in danger for whatever reason, but they were faithful to that. And when they were, people would say phrases like, he gave himself for me. You find that throughout scriptures. Even if the person didn't die, they give up all that they had. And it was understood as you sacrificed everything, your wealth, your, your honor, your time, your reputation. And if you were damaged in any way, but you expressed that faithfulness through your actions, people said, of you, wow, they gave everything. They gave of themselves. And that is the picture that is painted of Jesus. He gave literally himself for us. The ultimate picture of generosity. Now, just think about that. Think about as a recipient of that, what that meant, what that means today, what that looks like for us, and then how do we respond to this? Remember, if you, if you embrace, receive the grace, as we oftentimes refer to it, 
the generosity of God, the favors that are offered, if you receive that, you embrace that, you cannot help but respond because you have now entered into a relationship. And a relationship, we say, is two ways, right? The, pic the picture that is painted for us is three. The three graces. The mindset of the generous, the gift itself, and the recipient. But if we're the recipients, we have entered into this dance of grace where there's interchange and exchange of favors. The question is, how do we now respond? How, is, how do you respond? What's the picture there? See, for them, it would have been natural. It would have been understood. It would have been very easy because they didn't have the idea of entitlement, which is throughout our thinking today. They understood that they, what they were given, they, it, they, it was given to them, and they did not earn it. They got that. Grace was never understood in the first century from the perspective of being earned. And in fact, the only reason Paul even has to bring that up is because it's in light of the Old Testament and in light of the law and in light of people thinking that they had to earn the grace, as it were, had to earn the favor of the God or the gods. But Paul says this is different. This is more like the patron. Now understand the generosity that is given and you did not earn it. In fact, you needed it and so you sought it out because you understood it was about who you knew and not what you knew or what you earned. And so what is our response? Some people would say, well, we can never repay, right, in like manner. See, because when we think of repaying, what do we think about? We think of repaying the very thing. So in other words, if I, if I, if I gave you 500 bucks and let you borrow 500 bucks, how would you repay me? Well, 500 bucks, you better give me my money. Oh, we would think we're gonna attack interest on that, right? You're not just going to give me what I gave you. You're going to give me more. You're going to exceed what I gave you. That's not the case. See, here's the thing. <laughs> Getting into the mindset of the people of this time and understanding how they would have understood grace and how, how they would have responded and what they would have understood when they were given something freely, that response was totally different because they understood. There was no feeling of being entitled to anything. Even if you're not entitled, even with this to be honest, even when we're not entitled, we feel entitled, if we're honest, which is why we don't really feel grateful or thankful. We might say it, but do we actually feel it? We say it because it's proper and right. Do we actually feel it? Do we actually feel it deep down at how the gratefulness and the thankfulness that should be there because of the thing that was given to you that you that you did not earn. Getting into, we have to get into the mindset, if we can, of these people. As I said, oftentimes patrons would take on clients, superior to inferior. The superior would never expect the inferior to be able to repay equally what they gave them, which seems crazy to us, because why would you enter into a relationship with someone who cannot repay you, and where you cannot double your profit? Yeah, because that wasn't the point. What they did know was that how they would repay would be of some, some way that would benefit them in the future by some service, some act, building up their reputation, getting other people to want to attach themselves to the benefactor and in doing so increasing his, his power base, if you will. So they never really expected to receive that $500 back with interest. They understood that. That was the danger behind entering into a relationship with someone. But that was something, which is why you would say that was very generous, not expecting to receive that in, in return. And so they did not expect necessarily to receive that, but what they did expect was you to be faithful to the relationship and to be there for them. Be trusting and loyal and dependable and committed to this relationship. There was no entitlement. And so we have to work our best to get beyond that idea and understanding how grace literally speaks about something that you did not earn. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of generosity. But the question is, what could they do? How would they respond and how could they answer grace with grace? Remember, it's an interchange and exchange of favors. What can I do for you when you got more money than me? What can I do for you when you have power and I don't, which is why I need you? How do I respond to this? Well, as we wrap this up, I'm going to do something that is, that is out of the norm for myself. I got five points. 
And there could have been a whole lot more. <laughs> this stuff is jam-packed in the New Testament. And we miss it. So oftentimes we overlook it. There are five ways I want to present to you today that the New Testament, specifically Paul in a lot of ways, expresses or helps us understand or helps us see how they, the natural response would have been to the grace that they had received and understanding what that grace was. Grace was generosity, God's favor, and it was more than just a one-time thing. It was an ongoing thing, growing in the grace of, of God. And so I have five things I want to mention to you this morning. We can unpack each one. We could be here all night, but you're not that patient, and I don't have that much time. So five things. How do we respond to grace? What does the New Testament tell us? Well, the first thing is pretty obvious, by giving thanks. In other words, by being thankful. When someone gives you something, what do you say? What is the natural response? Whether you, whether you actually, actually feel thankful or not, what do you say? Thank you. Right? But New Testament paints this amazing picture of giving thanks. Paul says it. There's a reason why Paul says it over and over and over and over again in light of God's grace. Ephesians 5.20. Paul says, give thanks always and for everything to God the Father. In other words, you stay in this mindset, in this disposition, in that head space, in that heart space of being thankful. It's a certain outlook. It's a certain perspective. Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in light of grace. He says this in Colossians 3, verses 15 and 17. He says, be thankful. Then he says, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks this is the kind of stuff we just pass over. He says, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians 4, 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with what? Thanksgiving. There's a reason why Paul says all of this in light of grace. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks where? In all circumstances. It's a certain mindset, it's a certain perspective, a certain headspace, a certain heart space, being, maintaining, living in this space of thankfulness. It's being grateful for things. And Paul, Paul was the perfect image of this because in every single one of his letters, he says over and over and over again, as he does in Romans 1, 8, as an example, he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Now, Various letters, he does this a lot. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what he's thankful for here. In each one of his letters, he says things, I thank my God for you. And then he gives the reason. I don't want us to focus on the reason. I want us to focus on just the simple fact that he is thankful. That's the point. Paul, Paul, Paul is a perfect example of someone who, by the way, did not live along Jesus Christ before he, before he was resurrected. And he is the perfect image of what it looks like for you and me today. Being thankful, acknowledging, realizing, having embraced and accepted the grace that has been given to him. And this ongoing favor, Paul understood that, and that's the image that he paints for us. We pass over this language. But the perfect image is there, right there. Take note of it. He's always thankful. And he's always saying, you be thankful. And he's saying things like, be thankful in all things. Like, who could be thankful in all things? Well, when you're living in that certain heart space, you're living in that space, you understand. So our first response is just to simply be thankful. Any, any client worth, worth their gratitude, remember gratitude was basically your, was your credit, credit line. Anyone who was worth that would immediately express that thankfulness for the thing that had been offered to them. So how do we respond to grace with grace? Just simply by giving thanks. Learning how to live in that head space, in that heart space of thankfulness. Being, being grateful. It goes beyond just words. But you know it. You feel it. It's a deep thing. And it's a rooted thing. So there's number one. And that's weird for me to say. But give thanks. Number two. How do we respond to grace? By praising God with words. You know, this is one of the things that a client would immediately be expected to do. Remember, they were spread the word around about the generosity that was offered to them, that was given to them. That's why the people whom Jesus healed went about spreading, spreading the word. It was a very natural thing. They had been given grace. They had been shown generosity that no one else could give. And the natural response was just to spread it. Let me tell you how generous this guy was. Let me tell you what she did. That was a natural response, and that would have been expected. But here's the thing. This praise was not just simply done in the presence of that person. 
<laughs> it was done everywhere they went. That's why the word spread about who Jesus was. And in doing so, it increases others' awareness, okay, of the honor and generosity of the patron. That was a natural response that would have been expected of you. And in fact, you would have wanted to do that. It's the reason why Paul says in Ephesians 1, 6, that God's generosity, grace, that was revealed through Jesus, leads to, notice what he says, the praise of his glorious grace. The word glorious there has to do with honor. In other words, God's glorious grace lifts him up and, and really demands or naturally leads to people seeing him as honorable. He says this, the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed. The New American Standard says, freely bestowed. The Greek word here literally has to do with someone who's being endowed with grace. Let's read it again. God's generosity, which he talks about in verse 5, revealed in Jesus, leads to the praise of his glorious grace. God's grace leads to what? The praise of that grace. That's the picture that's painted for us, which he has endowed, blessed. When you think of the word blessed, think of the word, the ideas of being endowed with grace, filled with grace, covered with grace, however you want to say it. Blessed becomes another one of those words that, like love, but really doesn't really have much meaning to us. When you're blessed, you have been shown favor. You have been endowed with grace. And that leads to acknowledging that, seeing that leads to God being praised. Peter gets in on the action. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Peter says, listen, acknowledge who you are. Okay, let's set this up. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That, here it is, you may proclaim, Greek word for publish, that you might publish it. We know how to publish things, right? Everybody wants their voice heard today. We live in a completely different, you know, I don't think the first century would have been able to handle Twitter. Instagram or any of the social media platforms by which you can voice your opinion. You voicing your opinion was unheard of depending upon who you were. He says, we though can publish, we can proclaim the, oh, I love this, excellencies. It's a Greek word for virtue or the character. So what are you proclaiming? The character of God, the virtue of God, based on the generosity of God or the grace of God. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, the virtues and the character of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. There's the grace. There's the favor. There's the generosity. There's your evangelism 101. You ain't got to work anybody through the Bible in order to evangelize, in order to demonstrate or explain the generosity of God. See, that's the first thing we want to do is sit down and let me open up your Bible and see. And people, no, 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 no. He says, listen, listen, listen. When you acknowledge, when you embrace the generosity and the grace that has been given to you, the very natural response, the very thing that leads people to wanting to attach themselves to God is by you publishing the praises of God because of what he's done for you. I think maybe we might struggle with evangelism because we struggle with actually understanding and embracing what God has done, what he is doing on an ongoing thing, not just something he did in AD 33 or whatever date you want to assign to that. It's an ongoing interchange and exchange, how God is acting in your life. You know, those people who say, praise God all the time. Oh, they attribute things to God all the time. Yeah. Those people who get on your nerves sometimes, yeah, that's the picture. That's the headspace. That's the heart space. You acknowledging what he has done, you embracing that naturally leads to you praising, bringing praises to him. And in doing so, in doing so, people will want to attach themselves to him. It's acknowledging the graces of the favor and faithfulness of God in your own life. And you sing it. You sing his praises to others, not just when you come to this place. In fact, this should be the minimum. He says, public praises for his gifts and the help we receive from God. Yeah, that's how we respond. So you praise with words. The third thing, <sighs> praise God with actions. Let's praise God with actions. But what I want you to understand about this is that your actions lead 
to God being praised. That's the picture in the New Testament. Your actions lead to God being praised. Here's where, here's where the dirty words come in. Good works. This is where good works fits into the picture. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory. In the Greek here, literally has to do with, give glory, two words here in the Greek, have to do with someone coming to a conclusion, a disposition, a understanding, the opinion of. And in this instance, it's the opinion that God is worthy of being held in honor. That's the picture here. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory. Hold him in honor. They will hold him in honor. They will give glory to your Father who is in heaven. See, how we live brings honor to God, advances his reputation. And that's exactly what would have been expected of a client. 2 Thessalonians 1, 11, and 12. I like the NIV. I think it paints the better picture here based on the original Greek. Paul says, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. Remember, faith has to do with the relationship. Don't just think about some things that you say that you can agree with being yes or no, true or false. That's not faith. That's not the biblical definition of believe either. Remember, belief is not trusting. Faith is a trust, a trust, a loyalty, a commitment. And because of that trust, loyalty, and commitment, you are going to entrust. That's belief. And then Paul says, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. In other words, your relationship is what leads to this. You want this, you desire it. And he prays that God will act in your life by grace, with grace, in order to bring this about. And we pray, he says, this so that the name, we pray this, why? So that your actions will lead to the praise of God. So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified, honored in you, and you in him, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, by increasing his reputation, others might seek to attach themselves to him as their benefactor. Your actions lead to praise. The way you live your life, of course, this is nothing new, but now you understand it in light of the patron system, an understanding in light of the way these people lived. Number four, we respond with grace by showing loyalty. Showing loyalty. See, when you attach yourself to a patron, it could be a dangerous and costly experience, depending upon who they were. Patrons might have, they were powerful people. Uh, they might have enemies. And you entering a relationship with them means you have to be loyal to them. You've got to stick by their side. And they're going to do yours. They're going to do that to you as well. Sounds like the mafia, doesn't it? It's very strange, right? Which makes sense because Italy, Rome, mafia, okay. And if you had, you could have more than one patron. And if you had a patron and you entered a relationship over here and these guys were enemies, what does that mean for you? By you being faithful to one, you might end up having to be unfaithful to the other. And that could be bad news. Entering into a relationship with a patron can be a very dangerous thing. You can lose your life. You can lose your reputation. You can lose your wealth. So could they. Patrons had enemies. When things go south with the patron, you were expected to stick by them. So it was a dangerous proposition. Your gratitude was demonstrated by, by staying by their side to the very end. I think Peter paints the best picture of this. I think 1 Peter chapter 1 is the best chapter in the whole Bible. In fact, I think we could just take 1 Peter chapter 1 and we can just preach on that every week till the day I die. Paul paints this amazing picture about how, how God, God has offered up and given us and poured out this amazing grace and generosity and opened our eyes to seeing things and helping us understand where we are. He says praise. He sings God's praises for this generosity. It's a perfect picture of grace. And after he paints this amazing picture of what we're involved in and what we have, he says in verse 6, In this you rejoice. <laughs> you like that. It's good stuff. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. There's the danger. So that the tested 
listen, so that the tested genuineness, that word genuineness there means trustworthiness or loyalty. Your, your trust and devotion and commitment, your faith is being tested. So when your faith is being tested, your trust, your loyalty, your commitment to God is what's being tested. He says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, <laughs> may be found to result, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We respond to God's grace with grace. And sometimes the word we need to use to explain that is called loyalty. Loyalty. And finally, <laughs> I said all that to get to this, and this is the most important. So if you're sleeping, wake up. I got up here a little late, so I got a little bit more time. The way that we respond to God's grace is through acts of service. And you might say, well, what's, what's the difference between that and some other things that you've said? Well, I want you to look at this from a certain perspective, okay? So pay attention. This is what a patron would expect of a client. Services performed on behalf of the patron, okay? Services performed on behalf of the patron. In the New Testament, you'll see terms or phrases used called good works, acts of obedience, or the pursuit of virtue. These things were being done in the name of, in the honor of, another. And none of these things are done, none of these things are offered to gain favor. They weren't done in light of, oh, I want, I want, I want more, I want more. It was understood that once you enter that relationship, oh, there's going to be plenty. But what you were doing was just simply in response because you felt an indebtedness to what's been done. And so how can I repay? And remember, you're looking for the most opportune time and the best thing to do. It wasn't like a debt where you're just trying to get over with it so you don't have to, you know, build up interest and then you just can't get out of it. No, 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 no. You were looking for the best, most opportune time to repay the thing, to, to, to show your, your gratitude for what has been offered to you because, well, you couldn't repay the same thing. Because if you could, why would you need them? You wouldn't need them. It was understood. And you didn't earn what they gave you, so you really felt an indebtedness to this. You're like, I gotta, I've got I've to do something. We use the terms repay. I have to do something here. And none of that would have been done in order to gain more favor. Just simply a grateful response. That's all it is. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. For the love of Christ controls us. How? How? Because we have concluded this. We've embraced this, that one has died for all. And he says, therefore, all have died, and he died for all. That those, because if God died for all, then he died, then, then, then all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. And so in some instance, you put yourself in the shoes of the patron. Then he says this, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, you know, Paul's, like, as a patron, okay, as a patron, Christ gave his all for us, right? He gave his all. And our full response would be to do the same, to give our all to him. And so Paul says in Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. I have put myself in the shoes of the other. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by the faith, the relationship, the trust, loyalty, commitment, and the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you put yourself in the shoes of another, and when you put yourselves in the shoes of the patron, here's what you understand. Here's what we need to learn. Here's what we need to grasp. When we put ourselves there, in this response, in this service, we are called to be benefactors. We are called to be patrons to others. That's why Jesus said to imitate God's grace. Luke chapter 6, verse 36, one of my favorite verses. Second to first Peter 1. He says, be merciful. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. It reminds me of the passage that talks about coming. We have, because of Jesus, we have this opportunity to come before the, this, here's the picture, the throne of grace and receive mercy and help 
in the time of need. And remember, the words that, that are used have to do with perfect timing, the most opportune time. That's the picture of generosity and favor and grace and faith and this relationship that we're talking about here. And so here's the picture. You be merciful as your father. So imagine this, just as God has his throne of grace. Here's just the picture. The picture is this, this throne of grace. And we've got to be careful that we don't take metaphors and pictures too far. Okay, we've got to be careful with this. Don't take it too far. But it's like as if God has this throne of grace. And you can come to that throne of grace and you can, you can ask in favors and you can expect to, to receive timely help. Not when you want it, but when it's the perfect time. So just as God has this throne of grace and you can come and expect to receive mercy. People who cross your path, no matter where you find yourself planted, no matter who they are, and not in light of anything they've ever done, they, this is what they should expect, even if they don't know, they should expect to receive mercy. Anyone who comes across your path could, should be able to expect the same thing that we expect to receive from our Father, from God, from coming to the throne of grace and receiving favor. So in other words, anybody who crosses our path, we should respond the same. Seeing ourselves in the shoes of our mediator, of our patron, as it were. That's, that's, that's Luke. That's the picture there. See, but here's the thing. I want us to back up as we close. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. Well, what you may not understand is that there's about nine or ten verses before this that leads up to this very statement. And what I want to do right now as we wrap this up is I want to read through these, and I want you, I want to challenge you. I want you to point out, I want you to look at, I want you to grasp, okay, the statements that are stated there by Jesus, written down for us by Luke, and the ways by which we show ourselves to be patrons, benefactors of other people. Let's start here. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. <laughs> Isn't that the very thing that takes <laughs> Jesus, God as being the chief benefactor and takes any expectations anybody could have of him way beyond anything that they've ever experienced. He says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. God is gracious even to those who are hostile towards him. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Listen, only grace could allow you to do any of this. Give to everyone who begs from you and from one who takes away, from, <laughs> away your goods, do not demand them back. What does that sound like? A patron offering up generosity, knowing that it will never be repaid. And as he says, you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. That's the relationship we enter in with faith and grace, interchange and exchange, both are loyal, both are dependable, both are trusting. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to give back the same amount. But love your enemies. So you're not, you're not, you're not a bank officer willing to hand out only because you're going to get something in return. No, you see yourself as the ultimate patron. Love your enemies. And do good. And lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful. Even as your Father is merciful. And then Paul goes on throughout his epistles saying things like, love one another, forgive one another, be concerned about the interests of others and not just your own, and on and on and on. This is how we respond. This is how we respond to grace, by giving thanks, 
by praising God with words, praising God with our actions, by showing our loyalty, by acts of service, by being patrons, giving grace to others. This is how we dance the dance of grace, the interchange and the exchange. Your challenge is to go forth and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your grace. Help us to understand it more fully. May we not just embrace a gift, but acknowledge the depth, the richness of that gift. May we impart grace as it has been imparted to us. Show us, challenge us to do the same. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.